Yeah. Yep. Uh, thanks, Dan. It's always a, a pleasure. Um, so in this Bits and Atoms program at MIT, we're working on developing computers where the bits are atoms, or the atoms are bits, and the outputs of programs are things. I showed this last year. This was a student paper in Nature a year ago on essentially a manufacturing system that works like protein folding. This was another one more recently. This is high-speed video of little microscopic bubbles, where the bubbles are chemical payloads that are bits. And we're doing DNA synthesis with error correction and folding codes all the way up to making buildings. So computers that are tools, where programs are things. And then along with that, we're developing programs for computers that have 10 to the 23 parts. If you write programs the way you do for this one, it'll break. So programming tools on the scale of thermodynamics. Um, this won't be on the final. Uh, so what that's leading up to is we've done this de revolution. We can declare success. We've done this one. Uh, this was the last great analog computer at MIT Vannevar Bush did. The longer you ran it, the worse the answer was. We, we now have this kind, but um, you make airplanes by whacking at metal or melting plastic. You make chips by baking things. Manufacturing is still here. The research now in the lab is showing how to do fundamentally digital fabrication, where computers don't control the tools, but the tools fundamentally are computers. This is leading to a research roadmap to make the Star Trek replicator in 20 years. It's fundamentally a computing problem. To do the research with your tax dollars, thank you, we bought tools to make anything on any length scale, from nanometers to meters, focused ion beam writers, and Exomer micromachining and supersonic water jet cutters. I started teaching a class on how to use it, which I thought was for students to do research, but hundreds show up just begging to make stuff. Um, one of the stars the first year was Ben Resner, who's here somewhere, who made uh, his class project was a web browser for parrots. It lets parrots surf the net and talk to other parrots. And Kelly made a device that saves up your screams and plays them back later. And uh, Shelly made an alarm clock you wrestle with and prove that you're awake. And Meejin made a dress instrumented with sensors and spines to protect your personal space. So it's not technology for communication, it's technology to prevent communication. And the students started doing things like one made motor tape, a tape that moves things, and one made a rapid prototyping machine um, with the rapid, motor t rapid prototyping machines, and you use Lego bricks to make the circuits. And what I realized is if um, we're doing digital fabrication, the killer app of digital fab the students were showing is personal fabrication, um, products for market of one person, invention with the machines. Um, and that led to this project. When you spend this much tax money, the NSF says you have to do outreach. So they said, tell people what you're doing. That didn't sound much fun, so we made a deal with the NSF that we'd give them the tools to do it. So we made this little lab that's about a $50,000 version of $50 million. And it wasn't, there was no agenda. We just set it up in inner city Boston. And without much planning, they spread around the world. This is rural India. This is the coast of Ghana. This is a township in South Africa. This is so far north in Norway that the satellite dishes look at the ground, not the sky. And in each of these places, it was pulled by people didn't want to look at information on a computer screen. They want to measure and modify the world. And they don't want solutions from elsewhere. They want to do them themselves. So. Here's a kind of flow in the life we've been seeing in these labs. This wasn't an agenda, but the response. It starts with just kind of an empowerment. This is a high-tech craft sale that Amy Sun and Amon Miller and Sherry Lassiter did in inner city Boston with a laser cutter on a street corner where these girls made a few hundred dollars in an afternoon with just joy of discovery. Ranges to real technology. This is an eight-year-old girl in Ghana making microcontroller circuit boards, not for school, but just for the love of it. This was taken, what time, Amy? Like 11 o'clock at night. She wouldn't let anybody go home until she had a microcontroller circuit working. Then these little labs started doing useful things, which wasn't really scheduled. These are high-gain wireless antennas for a dollar in parts instead of 100 or $200 for mesh networks in Norway. Instead of a $100 computer, this is a $10 thin client computer made in the lab, developed locally. This is analytical instrumentation for agriculture in India. Um, this is something Amy did that came out of a long drive with a Ghanaian tribal chief who wanted to do energy. This is a solar-powered steam turbine aimed at producing energy mechanically for things like air conditioning and then stored mechanically and only producing electricity at the end. But instead of doing that globally, you can develop and produce it locally in the lab, all the way up to housing. They have to make millions of houses in South Africa. So they started using the rapid prototyping tools to do rapid prototyping of housing where there's no blueprints. The parts are plotted on the fly and the only tool is the rubber mallet. And when you're done, you have a house not mass produced, but custom produced, including all the furniture in it um, for $1,000 or so in the materials. 
Um, so none of that was scheduled. What it's leading to is tackling some of the most important development issues in these parts of the world, not by solving the problems, but by giving means for invention. So South Africa has launched a whole network of labs all across the country as this experiment in development through invention rather than having heroic solutions done by sort of the people in this room. Um, one of the most rewarding parts of that is we had a meeting this summer in South Africa bringing together the researchers and the people in the field. So Eric Winfrey and Paul Rothamon make smiley faces out of DNA. That's a few nanometers. And Hod Lipson is making printers that come very close to this is a printer that can print itself, that prints motors and batteries and functionality like that. These are village inventors in the Fab Lab. Um, what, uh, what was it? With Tebu, that's right, Tebu um, made a device so you can call a, a light in your house from a telephone for security to turn it off. And uh, Joseph? Rodney, Rodney. Um, th th this is iRobot. Ro Ro Rodney and Sochengovi in this township made a robot vacuum cleaner. Um, not as an iRobot product, but just for the fun of it in the lab. The best part was in the middle of this meeting, and I came upon all of them at lunch, and nobody's doing outreach to anybody. They're all just talking shop, the village inventors and the um, molecular fabricators. Um, this breaks everybody's boundaries. Though. This sits right in the middle of aid, invention, research, education, all of that, and it breaks so many organizational boundaries. We found we have to create our own organizations to occupy that space. So we're developing, um, with some people in the room, a fab foundation for invention as aid, a fab fund crossing VC with microfinance that I didn't understand doesn't exist but needs to be developed for this. And then the research partnerships. This is the lab in the north of Norway, and so many people are using it. They counted 6,000 visitors last year far above the Arctic Circle, that the little lab grew into, they built a gorgeous Viking longhouse with traditional materials, and then they built houses for people to live and stay and work. So the little lab has become a village for invention, the sort of magnet for outliers in society. So I tell that story in this book. Now I want to hand off to thanks to Chris Sanderson at TED, I met Majora, and one of the thing, things driving the labs are there's Hawk and the Herder and Mel the community activist and Callback the farmer and they all look different and they're all exactly the same and I met Majara and she's sort of Hawk and the Sami Herder in the South Bronx. And so that led to the idea of creating a fab lab here. Majara.